been speaking the last few weeks uh, on a couple of different topics and going around the themes of growth last week and, and maturity and realizing that that's a process. I'm going to throw up the title of, of today's sermon and it's Walk Before You Run. If you, I'll, I'll develop this as we we're talking today, but you know probably if you sit back and think about it in your own life, there's a process with everything. And if you jump into something too soon, you can really burn out quick and you get excited about it in the beginning and then you just kind of run out of steam. Come on, ladies and guys, how many projects do you have somewhere in your house that you started but you didn't finish? Come on. Nudge the person next to you if it's their fault because it's the, they started it and bought all the items for it. Anyone ever do that? Okay. No? Just, just me? All right. You buy all the stuff, you get all ready, you get all excited, and it's worse when someone it's right around a holiday or a birthday and someone buys you all the stuff for it, and you're like, oh, I just mentioned it once. I said I'm kind of getting into this. And now you have all the stuff and there's that pressure, and then you don't follow through. Well, Christian life is a marathon and not a sprint. And sometimes we walk into it with that excitement, but we're really not prepared for the long haul. I think about this uh, in a in a very practical way, when Claire and I were first married, um, we part of our honeymoon, we went to Aruba. How many people have been to Aruba on their honeymoon or just in general? Okay, right? Um, it looks good in the brochures if you stay near the beachy parts and, and the, the sand, but then there's a whole other side of Aruba that's a whole desert. All right? And so we're newly married, and, and, and you're still discovering stuff many years later. Amen, right? But in the beginning, you're just excited. All right, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? And so we rented a Jeep, all right? Like, I, I hadn't driven stick shift in a while, so it was like, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, I, I'm going to do this, even in, in Aruba. So we drive uh, a Jeep into the middle of the desert. And if you've been there, there's not really road signs. There's not GPS, so at least there wasn't when we were there. And you just kind of drive. Uh, we drive around and just kind of like, you don't know if there's going to like be a cliff or anything. You just kind of drive around. Anybody remember the natural bridge in Aruba? Okay. It's no longer there. It has collapsed, <laughs> which is kind of scary. People are like, what do you mean? Like, it, it was there when we were there, too. Years later, I looked it up, and it just, in the middle of the night, just fell into the water. So uh, it's kind of scary. And so one of the, we actually, we're so, you know, we're so adventurous. We're, we're, the, the Jeep is full of dust, and we get back to the hotel, and we're like, wait. How are we going to go out to dinner tonight? The, the Jeep is full of dust and dirt. So we traded that in for a regular car with doors. Uh, the, we weren't really ready. We weren't prepared. We are just kind of winging it. Anyone ever wing it? Is that how you live your life, right? Just wing it. Get in the car, we'll drive, and we'll figure it out as we go. All right, so we were doing that. So the next day we saw, we were looking around. There was also this thing called the natural pool. And I was like, oh, all right, pool. That sounds good. I want to go in the pool. And so we drove through this area that we didn't know. We literally thought we parked in somebody's backyard, and there was a little parking lot and a little sign that said, like, natural pool this way. And it was just like, all right. And so we hop out of this four-door car and flip-flops, shorts, bathing suit, right, because we're going to the pool, and we begin to walk. And I don't know if we read how long the walk was. Uh, we just kind of went with it. You know, we're in love. We're on a honeymoon. This is fun. And we start walking, and we go over one kind of like hill, and we're like, I don't see anything, do you? No, it's probably over the next hill. We went over the next hill, and there's another hill. <laughs> and again, at this point, you're like, all right, we got to commit. We're, we're, we're going to finish this through. Now, people are walking back on this path, and they look like they were going mountain hiking. They've got boots on. Somebody had a full gallon of water, like a jug of water. We didn't pack any water. We didn't have a backpack. We just thought we're going to the natural pool. Like, it can't be that far. The sign's right there. A hours later, like, we, we were walking and walking. We finally get to a top part. And like, there's the natural pool down there. Well, now we're, we're, we're sweating. We're hot. We've got to get there. So we get there, all right? And it wasn't that big of a deal. <laughs> it was like, because there's ATVs now driving past us on tours. And they're, like, watching us. Like, what are they doing? Yeah. And we're just walking there. And then, of course, someone says, it never rains in Aruba. We have the picture to prove that it rained that day. So we're walking back now from the natural pool. And now realize, when, when everything's really dry and it rains, what happens really fast? Like, it just turns to a river. It just turns to, like, mud. And, and so 
we are literally now walking up this hill. We have a picture somewhere in the honeymoon pictures, and there's this dark cloud looming behind us, and it poured rain. And then to top it all off, we finally make it back to the car, and there is the mother of all goose, mother, mother goose, I guess it was her. And this goose sees Claire and starts like, I guess they honk, I don't know what they do, and running towards Claire, and like, in perfect like horror movie fashion, Claire goes, ha, 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 and can't get the door. And we're like, I'm like, I, I was already in the car, I'm like, get in, get in, and finally she gets in, literally at the last second, and this thing runs up to the door. We'll be married 18 years in September, and uh, now we can laugh about that and just say, oh. <laughs> but we look back and we're like, we were not prepared. We jumped into this, and we were on the sprint. We were running, we were excited, let's do this, and we were not ready. And uh, we survived, but hopefully we learned from that, and uh, we wouldn't do that again. And I want that in our mind as we're thinking, because there are certain things in the Christian life, and it's not wrong, but we have to sometimes learn to walk before we run, because then we really can trip over our feet. All right, pay attention now to these verses, all right? I want you to look really good with me. I'm going to use the same verse from three different versions, but I want you to see there's a difference in one of them. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. We've been hanging out in Ephesians 4, Ephesians 5. Uh, last few weeks. And it says this. This is from the NIV. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Ephesians 4 verse 1 in the NLT. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. All right, one more verse. And you tell me the difference here. Verse 4, 1 in the ESV. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Which word changed? Anybody pick up on it? Walk. What was it before? Live. Okay. Well, like, wait a second. We're walking or we're living. Which one is it? All right. Let's discover this together. All right. This word is to walk, 4043, in your strongest concordance, okay? I had to look up how to pronounce this. Connie was laughing, because I was working on my sermon last night, finishing some things up, and she's like, who are you talking to? I said, myself. I'm trying to make sure I pronounce these words right, okay? I'm not a Greek scholar, uh, and I don't speak Hebrew or Latin or anything like that. Um, I barely can speak English sometimes, so that, just bear with me. So this word, because it's going to keep showing up in a couple of things we talk about today. So I'm going to do my best to butcher it. It's the word parapateo. Can you say it with me? Parapateo. All right. It's easy for Christian because that's like almost his last name backwards. All right. Um, this, what this means is literally walk around. Walk around. Here's an example. In a complete circuit or going full circle. Now that seems easy enough. But remember, this is always so critical with the Bible. The Bible might use the same word, but the usage is different, and therefore the definition is different. Got that? But we just see live. We just see walk. We're like, well, which one is it? Are we walking or are we living? All right, well, in Hebrew culture and mindset, in an ethical sense, it means this. I conduct my life or I live. Here are some other synonyms that would go along with this. Behave, conduct ourselves, leading life, daily conduct lifestyle, habitually live. They sound repetitive. They're meant to be. There's all different ways to use this. And so when the Bible isn't talking about a literal walking around, when it's using this parapateo word, it means, how are you living? What are you doing? What does it look like every day? How do you conduct yourself? What does your life look like? So that way, that word walk and life is sort of interchangeable in that right context. So the versions are not wrong. Here's another verse that we read last week. Now put it in context here. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Because we can read that and be like, all right, do, how do, I, do I walk in the way of love? Is like, I know it's not literal, but how do I do that? Anyone ever ask that question? Come on, let's be real. We, we read it and say, oh, that sounds nice, but I don't really get it. So part of growing up and maturing... And this is a process. 
This idea, and again, we use it in Christianese all the time, right? How is your walk with the Lord going, right? If it was just show up at Peconic Park and do a couple laps with Jesus, that'd be easy, right? Oh, I was walking with him. It was great. He was a little, walked a little fast, but I caught up. <laughs> but like, it's so much bigger than that. If that's all it was, just a physical walk, but it's not. It's our life. It's how our life is going, what we're doing, how we're walking with him. All right, I'm going to quiz Gabby and Joe. All right, let's see if they remember. Our first youth shirt had three words on the front of the shirt. Do you remember what they were? All right, you're fired. Okay, no, just kidding. There were three words. I don't know. You expect me to remember that? Yeah, that was the orange shirt. It was an orange shirt. Okay, Claire, do you remember? That's it. Oh, if my wife doesn't remember, then we're in really trouble. So on the front of our youth shirts and youth group, it said the word no, K-N-O-W. No, walk, and show. And the idea was that there was a process. Our youth group was called The Way. And, and, and I want you to understand, it was a really simple, right? You, you know Jesus. You, you know who he is. You understand that concept. And then you begin to walk it out, right? There begins a daily walk. And then you, by just naturally, you'll show other people. It was just a simple thing. But I remember that, like, realizing, like, that's such an important thing for us to understand as Christians. There's a process. And sometimes we walk before we run, and we have to do that, and that's okay. And sometimes we're so excited to run that we can skip steps, and then when we get to the running, we're like, oh, oh, whoa, I am not ready for that, okay? I guarantee if I told everybody to sprint to the end of our driveway and get the mail and come back, and we're going to time you, Many of you will never come back to church again. All right? That would be rough. We would not be ready for that. We're going to walk through some verses that use this exact verb. I, I find it exciting when I find a word and I understand it, and then you look it up, you're like, oh, that's the same word. Oh, that's the same word. So here we go. Galatians chapter 5. You're probably familiar with these verses. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Notice I've never seen that verse like on a Christian t-shirt. You're not to do whatever you want. I think that should be on a bumper sticker. Amen? Right? Because that's what we're like, oh no, we can do whatever we want. Like I'm free. I'm forgiven. It's grace. Like no, no, no. The Bible's very clear. We can't just do whatever we want. What does it say? So I say, walk by the Spirit. And that doesn't mean just like walk by him? Like, can I just have to get... No, 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 no. It's a lifestyle. It's an ongoing process that we will and can learn. I'm going to read a very wordy kind of thing to you, and then I'm going to break it down and make it a little bit easier. It says this, But where does the believer acquire the resources for this kind of victorious Christian living? Modern religious pedagogy offers many answers. A winsome personality, one's innate abilities, advanced degrees in theological education, special seminars on the higher Christian life, social activism, and spiritual psychotherapies, and others. Here's a little bit easier way to understand this. How does a believer get the right stuff to live this way? Modern religious jargon may answer in several different ways. A winning personality, your own God-given gifts and abilities, lots of degrees in Bible and theology. Special seminars on walking in the spirit, social activism, and spiritual ther therapy sessions, and more. That might be why we think, like, here's what it says, and I, I love this, and I have to quote it, because this is what Paul is saying. Paul's answer is the Holy Spirit. Only the Spirit of God, who has made us free from sin and given us new life and regeneration, can keep us truly free, as we experience, through walking in Him, the power of sanctification. Sanctification is a fancy word that we use in church to say it's a process that we come to Jesus, we ask him to forgive our sins, we realize that we need that forgiveness, and then we begin the journey. And sometimes we get excited, like, run, 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 let's go! And that's not wrong. But then we go, oh man, this is a little tougher than I thought. I'm bowing out. I gotta sit down. This is too much. And there's this process that start, has to start happening in us. That's the sanctification process. That's where we're really excited at first to give it all up. We're forgiven, we're free. And then our past starts to come and haunt us. Then people start to say, oh, come on. 
you're really into all that religious stuff. Come on, come back. I even remember that when I first started taking my faith serious. People kind of, in, in ways that like, you don't expect, they're not always saying, hey, come over here and sin. <laughs> but they're just kind of like, oh, take it easy. Relax a little bit. And you're like, wait a second. No, no, no this, this means something to me. Like, I, I want to be all in. Like, I, I'm walking with the Lord now. And so this is an important thing. Galatians 5 uses four distinct verbs to explain this. We've talked about this here at True Life before, and I'm going to throw them up here on the screen. To walk in the Spirit, to be led by the Spirit, to live by the Spirit, and to keep in step with the Spirit. We're going to hone in on that walk part of this today. We just read it in Galatians 5, 16. And this is what it's referring to, a relationship, right? We, we, we say that too, right? A relationship with the Lord. So that's that idea, that walk, that relationship, that lifestyle. A relationship of dynamic interaction, direction, and purpose. I want to say that again. A relationship of dynamic interaction, direction, and purpose. How many people want a relationship with God like that? Dynamic interaction, right? Not just like, hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? Right? Would you say you really interacted with someone, walk into IGA, IGA and say that to everybody? Hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Oh, man, I just interacted with so many people. I just, it was so fulfilling. I got, no, nah, it's just something you say. I get it. And then direction, right? A relationship of direction and purpose. Then it becomes a walk. Then it becomes a lifestyle when it's that ongoing thing. And so there, there's a way that this verb Peripatite or walk is used. It indicates a present activity now in progress. So in Galatians, when they're using this, it's not saying, oh, it's just something you do occasionally. It's saying, no, it's in progress now. It's in progress now. I do not like walking into the movies late and missing the previews, missing the first five minutes. I don't know how people do that. They come... I'm in with their popcorn. I'm like, I want, I want the whole experience. I want to be there when the lights go down, and I want to watch everything. I just, I, I enjoyed that as a kid. Now, I won't lie, I enjoy that I can sit home on my couch. I can buy the movie. I, 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 can, I can eat all the popcorn and candy I want. I can edit it with clear play and take out stuff I don't want to see. If you didn't hear about that, I'll tell you about that more later. It's all you can eat, right? But, like, I like that process. And, I, and again, my family knows this, right? If you interrupt, I will pause it and be like, all right, everybody sit down. Like, oh, come on, we're doing this, so we're not doing this. And then once I'm into something, and it's bad, if it's, like, during it, I'm following. I'm looking up on inter internet movie database, like, who is that actor? What were they in? I'm looking up random facts. And the next day telling the kids, oh, I saw this thing. And they're like, all right, Dad, whatever. <laughs> I'm looking at biographies. I got a t-shirt. There might be a poster. I won't buy the collectible, even though sometimes I want to, right? And I'm into it. And that's kind of the point with the gospel. We're supposed to get into it. It's not just supposed to be like, oh, yeah, it's something we do occasionally. Can't be something we do once in a while. Oh, just on Sundays. Just the CEO Christians, right? You know what that means? Christmas and Easter only, right? Suddenly, like, oh, everyone's spiritual around Christmas time or Easter time, like, it's amazing the people who do Lent <laughs> that don't even go to church all year. I'm sorry. I'm just going to throw that out there. Like, I'm not saying Lent is bad. I'm saying it's not the point to just do it for a little short period. The gospel speaks over and over again. I want a walk. I want a lifestyle. I want you to habitually commit and conduct your life in a certain way. For example, the students of Aristotle were known as, here's this word again, peripatetics. Okay, there's that word. They were known as that because of their habit of following the philosopher around from place to place as he dispensed his teachings. So this verb would be known in the Greek world, right? It's basically Christian groupies, right? <laughs> like you just follow them around. I remember this, not in the exact same way, but when do you learn stuff? It's just like hanging out. That's what fellowship is. So that's our other Christian word. And it basically means hanging out with a purpose. You're not just hanging out. What did you do? Nothing, <laughs> right? Something's happening. I remember hanging out with people in college, and one of the things that I remember for some reason was I liked football, and again, American football, not soccer, whatever, or you want to get confused by what I'm saying. And, and, I, and I knew it a little bit, but I had a roommate that was really into it. And 
You know, we'd watch football, we'd play football, we'd talk football and whatever. And I learned a lot by just being around him because I could ask all the questions and be like, what are they doing right now? I don't know what that is, <laughs> you know? And not feel dumb to ask those questions because you don't want to be in a big thing and everyone's like, hey, let's talk the talk. And you're like, I don't really know what I'm talking about. I just know a little bit, so I just, you know, stand on the outside. There's a process, right? And this idea of walking means it's part of who you are. You're, you're following the teacher around. You're being led by the Spirit to do certain things, to, to grow and to study and to make it a walk, to make it a lifestyle. And Paul's vocabulary, to walk in the Spirit or be led by the Spirit, means to go where the Spirit is going, to listen to His voice, to discern His will, and to follow His guidance. Now, if you are overwhelmed by that statement, start somewhere. Start somewhere. We, we always hear that and we're like, oh, you know, we see it in the Bible that people were led by the Spirit here. Well, how'd that happen? You know what? They don't tell us the process. I remember years ago uh, with our teenagers, with our youth group, we watched these videos about public witnessing, right? Tor talked about this, that, that confrontational witnessing where you just start the conversation. Now, uh, some of the videos we watched uh, had Kirk Cameron in it. So I was like, oh, that's no fair. He's already a celebrity. So of course people are going to say, do you want to take an interview with a, you know, a, a celebrity person um, and they're halfway known? So they might do that. And so I actually called up the company because we were struggling with this in the middle of Shirley, just so you know. It wasn't it was so easy. You think like, oh. And they said, I said, I, I really enjoy some of the teaching and stuff, but how do you start the conversation? Where do you start? And they were like, oh, well, you know, they didn't show you that. Even when we planted this church, I was given book after book after book on how you church plant. And I read a few of them, and I, I said, I remember saying out loud, they're missing the first chapter. Tell me how you get to step one. Step one was always just, this is happening. How'd you get there? And you might think this very same thing with being led by the Holy Spirit. How'd you get there? Because it sounds amazing, but how do you get there? I'm not going to tell you. I'm just kidding. It's a process. I like this quote, though. I want to read it to you first. In the battle between the forces of flesh and spirit, there is no stalemate. But the spirit takes the lead, overwhelms, and thus defeats evil. And so there's a, this process starts when you accept Jesus. And these are, this is, you know, I'm sure we can tweak any list there is. And this is the one I, I came up with. First, it starts with a desire. And we sometimes ask God, God, I want what you want me to do. I want, I want that. Because let's be honest, sometimes we don't want that. And it's inconvenient right now. I just, you know, just, just keep me out of trouble. Just let me get through the day. There's a different level of growth and maturity where we say, okay, God, what do you want for my day? Interrupt my schedule. Lead me, guide me, do what you want to do. So we can pray, ask for a desire. And then we begin to hear and obey, right? I always say this. I think one of the biggest ways that the Holy Spirit speaks is through his word, through the Bible. Do what it says. Oh, hear and obey. Let's start with something really simple. Love your neighbor as your boss, right? Is that what it says? Right? Love your neighbor as your spouse. No, it doesn't say that. Not even in the message version? No. Love your neighbor as yourself. All right, sounds good. That one's on a bumper sticker. <laughs> that one's on a t-shirt. That's hard to do. You might get to that point and say, okay, I'm hearing what you're saying, God, but how do I do that? Ah, go back and work on that. Help, ask for help in that. Then we can move to discerning, discernment versus feelings. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Will God use feelings sometimes? Yes. But we have to know when it's just feelings and his spirit leading us. There's a difference. And we have to learn that. That through growth and maturity. So if we jump into step three and say, I want to know discernment. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Have you asked for desire? Are you hearing? Are you obeying? And maybe some little things first. Walk before you run. Now that might be fast forwarded for you. I'm not discounting that. There's no timeline on this. But sometimes we have to walk and make it a daily lifestyle, and grow in that. And then we can get to living, walking, and guiding the Holy Spirit doing that in our life. Amen? And I want this to become more and more natural in my life. 
It's supernatural, but I want it to become naturally supernatural. Like, like, it's like the training wheels are off, and I can do it without even thinking about it. Some of us would be scared right now, right, if I th- we threw the bicycles out in the parking lot and said, all right, everybody, let's go ride. And you're like, whoa, 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 I haven't done that in a while. And see, that's what happens with our spiritual life. If we were led by the Holy Spirit in the beginning, and then we've kind of backed off, we kind of get a little nervous. Like, whoa, 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 I don't know how to do that yet. He wants us to be pushed this morning. And then when this process starts to happen, the words of Jesus will be in your mind. His love behind your actions, and his power will help you control your selfish desires. That's what these verses in Galatians are. We're not just will it away and say, go away. Like, there's this process starting to work in us. We're starting to think the way Jesus thinks. His love is motivating us, and his power then begins to control us. One of the fruits of the Spirit, last one, is self control. He helps us do that. Let's look at another portion of scripture. Colossians chapter 3, 5 through 8. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. And look, this is so important. Here's that word again, peripateo. You used to peripateo in these ways. You used to live like that. You used to walk like that in the life you once lived. It wasn't just like you happened to stroll one day and, ah, I used to do that. Like, no, that that was the way you were living. That was your lifestyle. You no longer have that lifestyle. Verse 8 says, But now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. The walk, the actual conduct, reveals the life. And so, you know, we, don't, we always want to say, well, don't judge by the outside. <laughs> but the Bible says judge you from the outside, meaning you'll know somebody by their fruits, by what they're doing. Now, the, the tricky thing is we can fake people out. We can show some good on the outside, and it's not good on the inside. It calls attention to the outward conduct, but also to the attitudes and feelings from where that conduct flows. The Bible talks about this really clearly. I don't know if you realize this, but your, our attitudes and our feelings produce how we live. What's eventually inside will find their way, find its way out. Matthew 15 talks about this. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull, Jesus asked them? Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and those defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person, but eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. Wow, this list looks really familiar, right? Didn't we just read some of this list? In Galatians and Colossians, it's there. Luke 46, 45 talks about the same idea. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings up evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. What you're full of (laughs) will determine your walk. And that's not just going to happen overnight until we address it, until we allow God to work in us, allow the lifestyle that's there to begin to catch up with what we say, what we believe. I won't stand up here and say, oh, that just goes away overnight. But if we're not allowing the process to happen, if we're not making it a daily walk with the Lord, then we'll struggle. Colossians, we're back in Colossians, where we left off. It says, Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. And again, If it was just clothing, then that would be easy, right? Get on the Christian outfit. Here we go, the new self. It's a process. Here's an important part of this verse, though. Here, there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. I'm going to read some things to you because it's important that we understand the context of these verses. There was, there's intermingled distinctions of race, ancestral religion, class, and caste provide the best soil for the mutual suspicion and distrust 
which turn into the vices listed in verse 8. Well, what did we just read in verse 8? You must rid yourselves of such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. There was something going on in this church, in this culture, in this world, and it hasn't really changed that much. These divisions were of great importance in the ancient world. Greek civilization, after the conquest of Alexander the Great, that meant that the Greek, whether they were from Greece or not, Egypt, Asia Minor, or anywhere else, could regard themselves as a member of a privileged group. So the Greek looked down on the Jew, because the Jew is preserving and clinging to old culture. The Jew looked down on the Greek, because they thought they were shallow and had a whole polytheistic a polytheistic view of, of religion. The barbarians was a word used for anybody that did not speak Greek. So that's you thrown into a category. The Scythians were ex- actually extreme examples of barbarians, little uh, better than savages. The distinction between slave and free, of course, ran through ancient society. Does this sound very different than our world that we live in today? I feel like there's more categories popping up daily that we can get divided And it sure damaged human relations. The ancient world, just like the modern, was an elaborate network of prejudice, suspicion, and arrogance. So ingrained as 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 to be thought natural or normal. Are we seeing that today? Can I be real for a minute? This is happening within the church, in our world. Are you vaccinated? Are you unvaccinated? Do you want to wear a mask? Do you not wear a mask? We're not going to judge you either way at this church because Christ is all in all. You can have opinions. Okay? This is a scary thing to say. I have an opinion. My opinion may not be right. My opinion may change tomorrow. I'm sure you're wrestling with these same things as well. But how do we walk this out? How do we walk our faith out in the middle of all of these different divisions? I just touched on a few. There's there's thousands now. And I need to read what... I studied and read, and it's so important that we hear this. These distinctions, Paul declares with a breathtaking challenge, have become irrelevant in Christ. The powers of the world did indeed hold the human race in their grip, as men and women allow their habits of thought and action to be dominated by them. Paul's counterclaim, set before the church as a still unfinished agenda, is that these barriers and habits are in terms of God's proper will for his human creatures, neither natural nor normal. They are ultimately a denial of the creation of humankind in the image of God. That is not to say that differences cease to exist. Okay, very important. There are differences. It is to say that differences of background, nationality, color, language, social standing, and so forth must be regarded as irrelevant to the question of the love, honor, and respect that are to be shown to individuals and groups. Instead, Christ is all and in all. Now, I'm not going to say that's easy to just walk out and live that out. I don't, I wrestle with that. And I think that's good that we wrestle with verses like that. How do we apply that? What does that look like? I think it first starts with saying, I haven't been walking this out in all areas of my life. Very possible. Let's be encouraged that Jesus wants us to walk it out. He wants to start in a specific place. I want to share this last scripture with you here. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5-7. through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet, parapateo in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we parapateo in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his Son purifies us from all sin. It's interesting that he starts first with us as people. You'd think it'd be the other way around, but for some reason, this is the order he wanted to go in. What does it mean to walk in the light? Again, if it was physical, it'd be easy. All right, here it is. Just stand here, get in that light, and stay there. In his presence, this is what it means, without deceit or dishonesty in our mind or consciously tolerated sin in our conduct. I want to say that again because that's really, really important. We get in his presence without deceit or dishonesty in our mind or consciously tolerated sin in our conduct. 
Maybe it's okay to say, I'm not okay. I'm messing up. This is sin, and I have to admit it. No deceit, no dishonesty. Absolute sincerity to have nothing to conceal and to make no attempt to conceal anything. Isn't that the freedom that we want in Christ? Isn't that how we can truly walk it out? Because I'm not carrying extra baggage and burdens that I don't need to. Jesus canceled my sin on the cross. I don't need to keep taking it back up. I don't need to keep denying it or, or putting it in the closet or shoving it under the carpet. I don't know anybody that's actually ever done that. Have you ever actually swept something under the carpet and left it there? All right, you have. Very good. Thank you for admitting that. All right, now you know where to vacuum. So here's what happens first, according to these verses. First, we have fellowship with one another. It's interesting. Remember, there's that hanging out with a purpose. There's something that happens when we walk in the light. We can truly hang out with a purpose because we've got nothing to hide. I can be honest before God, and I'm being honest before you in that moment. Second is that the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. The verb suggests that God does more than forgive. He erases the stain of sin. And the present tense shows that it's a continuous process. We're not done yet. That's not an excuse. I said that last week, right? That's not an excuse. Oh, I'm not finished yet. He's not finished with me yet. No, no. <laughs> that means you need to keep walking until it turns into a run. That's next week. Here's another quote. found too many that I couldn't keep them from you. The condition of receiving cleansing through the blood of Christ and of enjoying fellowship with each other is to walk in the light, to be sincere, open, honest, and transparent. Very difficult to do. Let's be real. Right? That's our slogan as a church, where church isn't something you go to, but a family that you belong to. Oh, man, that's messy. Should we put that in a tagline underneath <laughs> to make it relevant? Oh, that's messy. Come on down to true light. Right? That's messy. I, we, we, that's the point. Because if it's just, we're just going to show, show up on a Sunday and a Wednesday and when we have stuff and check in and check out and punch our card and say, we're here. See you later. What's the point? I'm not saying it's going to be easy. We already read, we're not allowed to do whatever we want. We're supposed to be walking in the Spirit. And there'll be times where we're going to tell somebody, come on, catch up. Come on, you're lagging behind. It's always the opposite of my family, because I'm always walking fast. I don't even mean to. And I'm always turning around having to stop, because <laughs> I, I'm always walking ahead. Right? And again, spiritually, there, there's no ahead or behind. We're all in this together. We have to realize that. And when we're walking, but if someone's not walking, they're going to get left behind. You can call them and call them and call them. Come on, parents. How many of you done that to your child? And they're standing there and they're not going to move. And you're like, so all right, let's say we're leaving and we're going to go around the corner and say, we're going. And then they're going to run. Maybe. Unless they're really resilient. And they're like, uh-uh. It's something that needs to be worked out. The Holy Spirit empowers us to grow up, mature, and be consistent. I always say that when I talk about the Holy Spirit, because I see that through the book of Acts. He helped the disciples be consistent. To say what they believed, and then to live it out. To walk it out. To let it become a lifestyle. Was it a process? Absolutely. Just read any of the Bible let alone the New Testament, the disciples never totally figure it out. They kind of trip over their own feet. Peter is tripping over his own mouth all the time and just saying stuff out of turn, right? And that's the point, though. There's growth. There's maturity. They were walking. They were all in. I think we forget, and I'm so glad that the Chosen has reminded us that they literally walked, <laughs> let alone made it their life. They were in. This was it. Where else were they going to go? He helps us to walk, to walk it out in all areas of our life. I want to encourage you this morning to rely on his grace to get up, even if you've been crawling. Even if you feel like, oh, Pastor Keith, now I feel bad. No, 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 no. Guilt makes you feel bad and you stay and do nothing. When you're convicted, the Holy Spirit breathes life and encouragement into you and says, get up and get moving. Amen?
So don't, that's where that feelings versus discernment is. Is it just my feelings? Because I can walk out of here later and have a big bowl of ice cream and say, I feel better now. Okay? That was just feelings then. The Holy Spirit's going to keep working on you and, and encouraging you and say, get up. Come on. I love you. You're not finished yet. Get up. Move. But don't stay down. Think about this, these areas today. Maybe you struggle with all of them. That's okay. But start somewhere. Maybe you've never even said, I've never even said to the Lord, increase my desire. Because we don't just want to do this stuff naturally. I'm just being really real and honest with you. You don't just become a Christian and say, I love reading the Bible every day. And I love praying. Maybe in the beginning you do. There's sometimes days where you say, I don't feel like doing it. I don't feel it. The desire is not there. And you have to push through that. And say, it's not about a feeling. It's about a commitment. It's about a walk. I'm going to do this in spite of how I feel, in spite of what the circumstances may be. I'm going to continue to hold on to the Lord. I'm going to walk it out in every area of my life. Doesn't that speak volumes to other people when they see that for real? Oh, you're not just a Christian when you're around the Christians, and then when you're around everybody else, you're not. You're consistent. The Holy Spirit helps you do that. We can't do that on our own, because our natural inclination is to be like whoever we're around, and to fit in, and to make everybody, you know, don't ruffle any feathers, don't say anything, just fit in and get through your day. The Holy Spirit starts to whisper, be open, ask Him for that desire. He will, you will start to hear Him in a way that I can't explain. Is it audible? Sure, if you want it to be. For me, it's that nudge on the inside. It's that nudge. Oh, I know. I know at that moment. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. I know what I'm supposed to do. And I can listen, or I can do what we did last week, right? No, 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 no. I don't want to hear it. Get distracted. Do something else. And then we begin to discern. Sometimes the Lord uses feelings. Sometimes he doesn't. He says, I don't care if you feel it or not. This is the right thing to do. This is the wrong thing to do. And then we know we begin to walk. We know he's guiding us. And sometimes we can't explain it. I can be the first to tell you that. I can't explain certain things why the Lord did certain things, but I know it was him. And that's it. That's all I can go on. And again, that's it. He's been faithful. And if it wasn't him, then it was the tacos I ate the night before. And I just blame it on that, right? But there's a process that happens here. 